Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 23 of my beta campaign. Uh, you may recall last episode that I started to run into a bit of a kind of a glitchy issue with a, my SSTO, the Samayaji, where the roll became inverted, and this got confused when I had SAS on and it would roll it the wrong way. Well, that seemed to be just more of a kind of a portent of things to come, and the glitchiness continued, um, especially with the asteroid hunter that I had uh, launched as well that episode, the, the uh, Arabata A. Um, but I'll get to that later on once we uh, take a look at the Arabata A. But this here is the Arabata C, and it is on the hunt for a C-class asteroid. And I've already selected my asteroid and made my decision as to uh, how I was going to approach that asteroid. The, using the same sort of techniques as I did last episode uh, with Arabata A. Um, I'm flying this ship manually, and this is because I have an issue with these large liquid fuel boosters that are lifting this ship up. And you may recall uh, the issues were similar to what I had with Corpallo a few episodes ago. The Corpallo spacecraft used the same sort of boosters, and if I let the tanks go dry and separate normally, um, then uh, they completely come apart. Every piece that's connected to that tank comes apart and there's often lots of explosions and things crashing into each other and that's obviously not a good thing. And one solution I did discover was that if I turn the engines off a couple of seconds before the tanks are dry and then separate, uh, everything separates normally. So, so are you watching this squad? This is the way boosters are supposed to come off. They aren't supposed to explode. They're not supposed to crash back into the ship and take out engines. They're supposed to come off like this. But anyway, uh, I also actually have discovered another thing. Uh, I, searching into this, this, I found out that if you attach a strut from the booster to the radial decoupler, this makes no sense, but if you do that, then you can let them run dry normally and they will separate normally. Unfortunately, I didn't discover that until after I had launched or already put this particular ship into the building queue. So I, I'll have to wait for next time to give that one a try. And so here we are setting up our transfer burn out to that C-class asteroid that I'm interested in. And I'm using the same uh, process that I used last episode and I do apologize by the way for the night launch but if you watched last episode you would have I, I, I offered my explanation of why I launch at a particular time to to maximize the efficiency of my uh, transfer out to the asteroid and it really did pay off because I ended up with a 597 kilometer closest encounter using nothing but a prograde burn uh, from low carbon orbit. So I'm just going to do a single burn um, and then once I get the air Odyssey outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence I will take a look at my closest approach and look at tweaking that out there. So as we're finishing off this burn we'll, I'll end up setting up a uh, an alarm for when this uh, craft is ready to leave Kerbin's sphere of influence. But for now, it's time to leave it and get back to the Arabata A. Now you'll be getting a better look at the Arabata C in a future episode once it gets out towards its encounter. But with the Arabata A, it is, here we are. It has now been in flight for over 16 days and uh, it is just 20 minutes away from its encounter with KGP-382, the A-class asteroid. Now, there's a few things I need to talk about about Arabata as, as we go through this encounter. And this encounter, or this uh, rendezvous, turns out to be pretty tedious. Number one is I need to take off about a thousand meters per second. That's about my relative velocity to the target right now. And and at, f at first that sort of surprised me when I was, when, when I did, not that I didn't do asteroid encounters before, but I guess I never really paid attention to the numbers and just kind of went with it. But it, I guess it makes sense that the, uh, that it's about a thousand meters per second to match velocities because that's about what it took me to get out here and match it. And the asteroid and Kerbin are in roughly the same orbit, so roughly about the same amount of energy. So, the tr you know, the amount you need to match orbits, since the orbits were so close to begin with, is just really cancelling out the amount you needed to get out here in the first place. Now this was a very 
tedious approach for a number of reasons. Number one is SAS does not work with this ship. It is somehow glitched. If I turn on SAS, um, the whole ship starts oscillating madly, and I couldn't find any way for it not to do that. So I am using purely the flight computer. I played around a little bit with um, using maneuver nodes but, uh, to try and match velocity, but that turned out to be more frustrating than it's worth. So I'm using the flight computer. It's working just fine. This is the flight computer packed with remote tech. And uh, even at four times speed, I'm going to end up doing some some cuts in this because this, this took a long time. Uh, the other thing that makes it a little bit frustrating is that if you take a look at the top left corner, you'll notice that there is about a three quarter of a second signal delay. It's not a not that big a deal, but but it is something you sort of have to think about as you are doing your thrusting and closing in on your target. Anyway, as far as the rendezvous and how it works, it really isn't all that much different than rendezvous that we've done in the past. It's it's about hurting that uh, that uh, retrograde vector onto the target icon, and uh, at the same time trying to reduce your relative velocity to the target so that as you approach the target that relative velocity comes down to zero. And as you can see now that we've uh, begun to close in on the target I'll switch over out of map view and close in on the target again just using the same idea. And I'm, I'm approaching again very slowly because you know I, without SA I, I can't just come screeching in and put on the brakes really close because you know I'm using the flight computer and I and and I got a, a signal delay so I am approaching far more cautiously than I normally would but uh, you can see now that we're starting to see our asteroid and it's uh, time to bring our velocity down to zero and switch it over to RCS mode and like I said this took a long time I'm hoping when uh, we'll see when we get Arabata C out to its asteroid. Hopefully it won't have the same issues with uh, with SAS. So we uh, arm the grabber and I've now brought the video speed down to two times speed as we approach into the asteroid. Now I'll bring it down to uh, normal speed uh, for the actual contact part. And I, I was worried this was actually going to be a little bit tricky but in fact it turned out to be pretty pretty easy because uh, with the flight computer you got this target the prograde uh, the target prograde <laughs> and um, it aims itself straight at the center of mass of the asteroid so then it was just you know using RCS to kind of bring the velocity vector on top of the target vector and just letting myself come in nice and slowly remember that there is a there still is that three quarter of a second delay that you can't see here like every time I do a little bit of a, you know, push an input in. There's three quarters of a second before that input actually occurs. And uh, the other thing you might be noticing too is the amount of kind of flex that's going on. You can see it with the solar panels when I use the RCS. It's uh, that was one of the kind of glitchy things that was happening as well. Is that um, is I, I, I use some octagonal struts connecting the front part to the kind of engine tank part and uh, the RCS parts, or not the RCS, the remote tech parts in there are, are, are kind of glitched in there. So I actually had some remote tech spots that I'm just not using because I was worried it was going to mess things up entirely. And here we go. And contact. And unfortunately right away it gets all messed up with the targeting computer so I had to turn off the uh, flight computer right away. But no, that, that came out alright, I think. Here we're looking pretty good. Um, but like I said, there there is some sort of glitchiness going on with the infernal robotics. So I had these like infernal or uh, these these spots that were on pistons that the spotlights that were on pistons that went out to illuminate the asteroid. But I decided that you know it wasn't worth the risk to to get them out there. And I think part of the problem is using those cubic octagonal struts to try and connect heavy parts together. There's just not enough strength in them. I should have used some. Uh, some additional strutting to kind of uh, put this together. Unfortunately, Arabata C has the exact same construction uh, with just heavier parts, so it, it, it might have the same issues. Well, issues aside, now it's time to start to plan our capture. 
Uh, again, we got to put this asteroid into an orbit about Kerman. Now, I, I was a little bit concerned because uh, there is only 363 meters per second left now once I've got the asteroid attached. Um, but that turns out to be plenty. Yeah, it, you know, I, I, it's because, again, these the orbits between Kerman and this asteroid are fairly close together. So, you know, to get a capture doesn't take a lot of energy. It's not like this object has been falling from a distant place in the solar system. So getting the capture is no big deal. And what I decided to do, because I got this, uh, this idea that, uh, and I think this is inspired by what I hear of NASA's plans for, uh, for if they ever get around to doing some sort of asteroid capture, their big plan is to put the asteroid into a high orbit about the moon. And I thought, you know, that's a pretty cool, and then it's there, and then they can send expeditions out to it, and they can practice um, doing work way out, you know, out in deep space, not just in low Kerbin orbit. Well, not deep space, but the moon. But the moon has its advantages because if you're, if you're doing exercises around the moon, you can learn things about doing exercises far away from low Earth orbit, but you're still close enough that you can get back if worse came to worse. Unlike if you, for instance, set some people off to Mars, uh, you know, they're going to be on their own for months and months and months. So I got this idea that, you know what, I'm going to put this asteroid around the moon. That's kind of my idea. So I'm going to uh, reduce the... Uh, the inclination of my encounter. I want to bring the inclination down as far as close as I can to being zero, and I also want to get that periapsis down close to Kerbin's atmosphere. The idea being, I think I'm going to go for a little bit of aero braking to save as much fuel as I can because I'm going to have to do a further inclination change, and I want to get this orbit so that it's crossing the moon's orbit. And once I get my capture around Kerbin, and then I can look for a moon encounter and hopefully put this asteroid around the moon. And you know what? I think I might just do that with all the asteroids I encounter. Maybe I'll sort of, I don't know, connect them all together, do some sort of modern abstract asteroid sculpture. I don't know. We'll see what we get there. All of this hinges, of course, on having the money to be able to do it. Right now, money still is pretty tight. Now with this burn, it's definitely the sooner you do it, the better. So I got it coming up in just a few minutes. But then I kind of, I don't know, I got it into my head that, oh, you know, I should make sure that the uh, my ship is exactly lined up with the center of mass of this asteroid. And there's a pivot that's, that's in the grabber that you can uh, unlock. And then you can pivot your ship a little bit so it's pointing exactly. Now I'm really close as it is, so I... I it turns out I should have left well enough alone because doing it with the flight computer turned out to be a real pain. Doing it without SAS on turned out to be also a nightmare. Turning on the SAS got this thing all oscillating and stupid again. And uh, yeah, this is I should have just left it alone. So I ended up regretting this whole decision. And uh, it took quite a bit of effort to get it back to what it was supposed to be. Now, just talking a little bit about the construction, one thing you may have noticed with this thing is that I do have two sets of reaction wheels up there at the top of the vessel because, um, you know, I wanted the reaction wheels as far forward as I can because I knew as soon as I was attached to the asteroid, I was going to have a few tons of rock up at the front. And again, you want to have those... Um, those reaction wheels close as, as you can to the center of mass. So getting them up forward with these sort of asteroid grabbers is definitely what you want to do. But it turns out with this little small asteroid, um, having two of them was complete overkill. I didn't need that at all. Uh, so I only have uh, one of those reaction wheels um, activated. And you can see this thing has no trouble whatsoever uh, uh, slapping this asteroid around and turning it the way it needs to be. As well, you might be noticing at the back, I put a lot of RCS thrusters because I thought I would need that torque to bring asteroids around, but it turned out that was not necessary either. So, uh, yeah, this, this, this thing's a little bit of an overkill for getting this little asteroid, but, uh, yeah, you know what, maybe when I get a B asteroid, I won't have to adjust this thing at all. I can just use the exact same uh, ship again. So did you like that bounce while the engine was turning on and off? Yeah, those are those cubic octagonal struts. They they are not the strongest and most rigid things in the world. i got to really think about a redesign of this if I ever go out to get myself another asteroid. But anyway, the burn went out fine, so all that's left to do is to set... Uh, 
uh, an alarm for when this thing is going to cross into Kerbin's sphere of influence, which is going to be a little over 12 days from now. So we'll end up revisiting this craft then. You know, I've been talking so much about asteroids, I haven't talked about what else is coming up in this episode. I am going to take another shot at the Samyaji. That, uh, it's going to have another launch and uh, another descent, and hopefully this time a little bit more successful. And uh, it's going to be releasing a payload that is on its way to Minmus. Yes, I finally got a contract to do something with Minmus, so we'll be seeing that a little later in the episode. I also have the Aristotle II, which is my high altitude uh, supersonic jet, and it's going to make a trip out to the North Polar regions to do some temperature scanning and to uh, some more science to collect from some biomes I haven't gotten to yet. But right now we are visiting the Ptolemy, which has been in flight for 108 days, um, and it needs to make a... Uh, an orbital correction. Now, I was hoping to use Ike way back when I set up this maneuver node the first time to uh, to uh, kind of help me slow slow this craft down and getting it into an orbit around Duna. But I'm seeing now that my encounter with Ike is way off to the sort of the side. Um, it's 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 not in a very good spot to help me. Uh, get a capture with Duna. So what I'm going to be doing instead is changing this burn a little bit to try and come around Duna very, very close to a prograde direction, try and do maybe a little bit of arrow breaking, um, maybe a little bit of retro burning to try and get my capture. Hopefully get an Ike encounter too. I'd like to kind of get both at the same time, but I can't quite see if I'm going to get the Ike encounter just yet. So we'll set this up just to, again. This is just roughly because I'm still a long way off from Duna. Kind of do this this little bit of a correction here, uh, get it over with, and then uh, and it's time to uh, set an alarm. Uh, I'll give myself a 10 day warning before I get into the Duna sphere of influence. So that's going to be 163 days from now. It's like Oh, why does space travel have to take so long? But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to get back to this then. And that brings us to Tom Plock and Ruben in the Aristotle II. And these guys are performing some temperature scans, and these are all aerial temperature scans, so they're all pretty easy to pick up. And they're all in around the sort of the North Polar region, over the ice caps and over the tundra. And... Uh, Oh, I'm doing my turn here, and it's getting a little bit dizzy. I'm right over the North Pole pretty much, so I'm turning to the left to get to the next waypoint, but the camera's doing that thing of spinning around to the right, and yeah, a little bit dizzying. But anyway, Ruben is our newest Kerbinot. Uh, I just hired him, and he is slated to be part of the next crew up to the Hipparchus Station. He's our engineer. An engineer, he's our third engineer to go up there, but I thought, you know, I should give him sort of a warm-up mission, so... Thought I'd stick him in there with our trusty pilot Tom Plock to, uh, to do some surveys. And as I was flying around, all, all of this went pretty easily. Um, but I was flying over the tundra and I was going, you know, I hadn't picked up any science from the tundra surface yet. I'd love to land this thing, but I've been burn landing this thing before. Um, this is the same style of craft that crashed several episodes ago and killed a couple of my Kerbals, and uh, so I said, you know, no, you know, I, I better play it safe. I'm not going to land it just for getting some science. I don't really need the science, and I'll just fly on back home. And then I thought, you know, what the heck am I doing here? I'm playing a video game for goodness sakes. Video games aren't supposed to be about playing it cautious and all that kind of stuff. So I ended up lifting my rule that I'm not going to do these, uh, you know, quick save, flight, revert type of things. So um, I told myself, you know what? No, I'm going to attempt to land. I, I want to do it. I want to land into the Tundra with, with this plane, and if it goes bad, I'm just going to go back to my quick save. I'm going to try it again, and maybe I'll learn a couple of things as well about this plane and landing it, because I've had some issues with this plane and landing it, and for that reason, I've been avoiding it, and I shouldn't be avoiding it. So, anyway, here I am. Yeah, I'm coming in, and, uh, well, yeah, the first one <laughs> didn't go so well, and in fact, two more crashes followed that one before I finally did learn something. And what I learned was this, is that I've been, I was hitting the ground with my brakes applied at, this, at the time. And if I'm a plane like this, it's this heavy. If I hit the ground with brakes applied and the ground is uneven, one of those wheels is almost for sure going to be uh, 
gripping better than the other wheels and that's what's causing my plane to spin out and spin out of control and what I need to do is come in slower and drop slower and have the brakes off at the end or when I, when I finally touch the ground and be very very gentle with my braking I've been just sort of hard braking all the time I think I'm just used to lighter aircraft and as you can see here that ended up working for me just fantastic so there you go so here it is I learned something <laughs> And I uh, was able to collect my science and collect, collect my Tundra science and uh, take off once again and get these guys back home. And so, yes, okay, I did break my own rule on this one with the reverts, uh, but uh, I don't know. my mind, it was, it was worthwhile. And, and the thing to remember is, of course, it is only a game. So before I am forced to hand in my membership card for the Hardcore KSP Club, why don't we go to the Samyaji? This is the second flight of the Samyaji. You saw it last episode as well. And this time it has a different uh, payload. And this payload is going to be on its way to Minmus. Uh, so remember what we do is we launch into a low carbon orbit, release the payload, and the payload goes to Minmus. So we select Minmus as a target. And the thing is, is Minmus is in an inclined orbit. And like I've done in the past when I want to go into inclined orbits, um, even though I'm not going to go right to Minmus's orbit, I still want to be in an orbit that matches its inclination. So what you do is you use the moon's orbit to kind of get where zero is, and then rotate your camera around until you got Minmus's orbit intersecting with the moon's orbit in a line like I have here. Uh, you have to make sure that you do have Kerbin selected as your viewing center. And then once you have that, where Minmus's orbit crosses the equator is where you want to launch from. That is where, well in this case, where the descending node is. Um, so I want to time warp until my launch site is at that point. And then uh, I want to, as you can see here, launch to the south. Now the inclination of Mimus's orbit is six degrees, so I want to launch six degrees south, or in other words, I want my eventual heading to be uh, 96 degrees. Again, remember 90 degrees is east, and then we add 6 to go towards the south. So this is a way of doing this that saves you fuel in the end. Launching into a slightly inclined orbit hardly costs any more than launching into an equatorial orbit, but it saves you from having to do that later uh, orbital correction burn. And with the release of MAPSAT 4 and its activation, it's time to start to plan our transfer burn. So, and here's where you will see how matching the inclinations at this, you know, at launch really helps me out. I don't have to do an inclination change at all. Um, I can just plan my transfer much the same way as I plan my transfer to something like the moon, though Minmus is a little bit more finicky. It's a further distance out and it's a smaller target to hit. So don't be surprised if you have to, you know, play around with it a little bit more than you do with something like a lunar transfer, but after a little bit of playing around I was able to get uh, a closest approach of 250 kilometers almost dead south of Minmus, which is ideal because I do want to put this into a polar orbit because it's going to be a mapping satellite and 250 kilometers is about the altitude that I want, so I ended up getting all this with just a single burn uh, straight from uh, low Kerbin orbit. So we go to perform our burn and, well, as is often the case, planning the burn and executing the burn don't always end up being the exact same thing. And in this case, I ended up overcooking this burn just a little bit. That's an easy thing to do, especially with a small target like Minmus. So I have to turn myself retrograde and bring my orbit back down so I get my encounter again. And I end up with this, well, rather t lengthy transfer to Minmus where I don't get my closest encounter until 18 days from now and that's because uh, my apoapsis of my orbit actually goes out past Minmus's orbit and then I encounter Minmus on the way back. So well you know that happens. The important thing is is that I got the encounter that I wanted. I'm in and around 250 kilometers south of the planet so it should be easy for me to get this polar orbit that I want. Um, but you know, 18 days from now, that's not going to happen in this video, so we'll have to return to this vessel at a later date. And for now, it's time to see if we can get the Samayaji back down the Kerbin surface with a little bit more success than I did in the previous video. 
And as we begin to set up our descent, why don't we talk a little bit about who Samayaji was. Uh, Samayaji was a 15th century Indian polymath. Again, this is Eastern Indian, not uh, Native North American. And uh, he ended up at the time, writing a work on or a commentary on Aryabhata's work. And if you recall, Aryabhata was uh, came up with this model, this geocentric model for the solar system, where the Earth was stationary with the Moon and the Sun going around it, but then the planets orbited around the Sun. And what uh, Samayaji did was improve upon its computational power and actually produced a model that was the most accurate model for the solar system as far as making predictions uh, for positions of planets and eclipses and the like, up until the time of Johannes Kepler two centuries later. So, um, as, you recall, as you might recall from last episode, one of the issues that I had with the, with the Samayaji was, uh, was uh, the SAS or the flight computer, both of them had the same problem, reversing the roll inputs and cause the, this causes the craft to start to spin uh, out of control and I started to get the exact same issue here so yeah that's a bit of a problem what I think I'm gonna need to do is I think I'm just gonna have to build this thing over again from scratch not just keep using the same craft file so I'm gonna rebuild this thing hopefully that will get out whatever the problem is be honest though I could probably live with this because this thing seems pretty stable even if I turn the SAS off like it seems to want to stay in this orient oh okay there goes that what just broke off that is the communitron that I have in the cargo bay um, I was hoping that it would be protected but it doesn't so I, I lost connection temporarily but I got it back because I'm within 500 kilometers of the Kerbal Space Center which is just over those mountains you see on the horizon um, and I'm picking up a signal from the DP-10 antenna, which won't burn off. But anyway, like I said, I can probably live with this um, SAS issue, but I, I don't know. I, I, I want to resolve it. So uh, the other issue that I had with my landing, which should be one that's easier to rectify, is that I was just too late in releasing my parachutes. I waited until the last moment to release my parachutes and didn't slow down fast enough. So I'll make sure to release my parachutes earlier. Um, so here I am, and I'm waiting and waiting, and I'm just about ready to release. And then I, oh, I just lost my communication signal. What ended up happening here is that the Kerbal Space Center is now over the horizon. So although I'm not that far away from it, um, the curvature of Kerbin is blocking the signal and I have no control of this whatsoever. Yeah. Remember last episode when I made that promise that my next landing will be better? Well, I think I'm going to have to postpone that province because, uh, yeah, there's no way out of this one. I have no communication whatsoever. Now, I actually do have a plan for how I can save that communitron, I think, and get it back up uh, in this, so this situation couldn't happen again, but, uh, right here, yeah, this, there's just no way this is not going to end, uh, well. Uh. Oh, dear, is that, is that gonna survive there, maybe? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, oh, I see some tumbling debris. Yeah, that's all that's left. Little pieces here and there. Well, yeah, th this is gonna. This is still a work in progress, obviously. But uh, you will definitely be seeing this ship once again, and we hope to see you next time for that.